U.S. foreign policy has been hacked by big money. In an article first published last December, the renowned American scholar Jeffrey Sachs argues that the U.S. foreign policy is a scam built on corruption and it is the urgent task of American people to overhaul a foreign policy that is so broken, corrupted and deceitful that it is burying the government in debt while pushing the world closer to nuclear Armageddon. The article followed on the heels of national defense bills signed into law by U.S. President Joe Biden, which authorizes a record 886 billion U.S. dollars in annual defense-related spending. U.S. military spending already accounted for nearly 40 percent of the world's total in 2022. So how does the huge spending shape U.S. foreign policy? Exactly how corrupted is it and who are benefiting from the policies. I was joined from New York by Professor Jeffrey Sachs himself. He is president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. I started by asking him why the US gets into one disastrous war after another. Why is the United States uh, entering every one of these wars, trying to overthrow all of these governments and failing every time? Of course, I think the aim is wrong, but the failure is what is so incredible. The United States states a goal, uh, say that it's uh, going to transform Afghanistan. 20 years later, trillions of dollars later, complete failure of the U.S. objective. Similarly, in Syria, the United States tried to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. It created massive war, massive chaos, complete failure. It tried to change the government in Libya. It created civil war. It pushed NATO into Ukraine. It's created an open bloodshed. So I asked the question, what's going on? Uh, why aren't these uh, authors of this terrible policy long gone? The answer is, this is big money. This is big business. Uh, you mentioned the defense budget of nearly $900 billion, but there's a lot more defense, or I would say military spending, in addition to that. We have $300 billion on top of that in veteran spending. We have another $100 billion, roughly, in the so-called intelligence agencies. Uh, you add it all up, it's nearly $1.5 trillion big money, powerful interests, big companies like Raytheon, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman. Uh, these are the military industrial complex companies and a Congress which lives off of these companies for their future jobs after they're in Congress because they go into these companies or they go into lobbying firms paid for by the companies or their political campaigns are paid for by the companies. So we have a business operation, which is a disaster. Uh, it's extraordinarily expensive. It creates havoc around the world. It does not promote any real interests of the American people, but it's driven by money by campaign hey. contributions and by lobbying. Yeah, well, um, these are pretty grave uh, statements you are making. Can you give some concrete examples as to why or how these Washington insiders or their staff or their family um, are actually benefiting from the policies that they're helping to churn out? If you uh, look at a, uh, a member of the U.S. Congress in the Arms Services Committees of the House or the Senate, they are receiving campaign contributions by the very companies that they're supposed to be overseeing. Or they end up as uh, senior managers of those companies when they leave the Congress, or their family members, or they become, or their staff become members of the lobbying firms of these companies. I remember a discussion I had with the congressman saying we should stop pushing NATO enlargement to Ukraine. It's only creating war. And he said, well, but it's okay to sell the weapons to them, isn't it? And uh, I realized that his job is to sell weapons. He's on the Armed Services Committee. And so he's pushing weapon sales. It's big business. 
And we need to get out of the business and back to peace and cooperation in our foreign policy. What's happened since 2000 is the United States has spent around $5 trillion on the wars since the start of this new century, $5 trillion. We have an extra $2 trillion that will be the veterans' payments because of the disabilities that have come from these wars to American soldiers. Mm -hmm. So $7 trillion. This is an Un, this is a lot of money, even for the U.S. economy. Yeah. Well, indeed, you wrote in your article that uh, hundreds of billions of dollars are money down the drain, squandered in useless wars, overseas military bases, and a wholly unnecessary arms buildup that brings the world closer to World War III. Well, some people would say it is a lot of money, but it is necessary to keep Americans safe, to, you know, service all the military that uh, are keeping the Americans safe to provide for the military bases and to build more weapons. It is necessary, they would say. How would you say that these are money wasted? We're getting no security uh, out of uh, any of this. The United States is no safer. First, the United States is at no risk of invasion. No country in the world could invade the United States. We are at no risk. What is at risk is that the United States alone in the entire world has hundreds of overseas military bases. The United States has 800 overseas military bases in 80 countries. Now, those are being shelled right now because of the war in Gaza. Uh, so the United States soldiers are being attacked in Syria. But why is there a U.S. base in Syria? because the United States tried to overthrow the Syrian government. The soldiers are being attacked in Iraq. Why is there a, a military base in Iraq? Because the United States invaded Iraq on false pretenses in March tw uh, 2003. So this is endangering the United States to have this unique global network of overseas military bases. I don't think they should exist at all. It puts the Americans at risk. It costs hundreds of billions of dollars a year. It does not bring peace. It does not bring quiet. Every place in the, in the world right now where the U.S. is pushing this aggressive foreign policy is destabilized. Now the United States is trying to build new alliances in East Asia. This is, again, doomed to fail, in my view, but it is doomed to destabilize the world if the U.S. persists in this way. Um, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said that the budget request by President Biden is a strategy-driven document ensuring that U.S. military is the strongest in the world now and into the future. How do you look at the view that military spending or defense-related spending is essential in order to maintain U.S.'s global dominance? First of all, I don't believe in U.S. global dominance. I believe in U.S. cooperation. Why should one country that is 4% of the world population say that its goal is dominance over the rest of the world? The whole idea is misconceived. Our goal should be safety, security, cooperation, and peace, not dominance. So the aim is wrong. Second. The United States is already spending more than the next 10 countries combined in military outlays. So we are provoking an arms race rather than addressing an imbalance. We created the imbalance, the United States. We have to actually enter into diplomacy to stop the arms race, not to exacerbate the arms race. So I take exception to the goal itself, to state a country's goal as dominance militarily or any other way over the rest of the world is already to state a wrong goal. Mm. Well, goal the American public, according, yeah, and cooperation. The American public, the the average American household, according to your calculation, has lost. 40,000 U.S. dollars in the past due to this uh, military spending and is about to lose 12,000 per household in the year 2024 if the same plan is going forward. And yet, 
Where's the public outcry? I mean, you talk about the few who may hear the truth. They may say something, but the great majority seem to be okay with it or they seem to accept it or have to accept it because they can't have it other ways. Why is that? Is that the case? There is no real role of American public opinion in foreign policy. Uh, recently, uh, the U.S. transferred more weapons to Israel for what I regard as Israeli war crimes in Gaza, but it did it without any congressional oversight. Uh, all the Secretary of State had to do was to say it's an emergency, uh, and then it was an executive branch decision. The American people do not support these policies. These wars have been very unpopular, even with all of the propaganda coming from the U.S. government. So this is not a groundswell from below. This is not the public saying, oh, Professor Sachs, you're all wrong. We want this. This is from the top, not from the bottom. You... And of course, if the American people knew more and understood more mm. uh, about the facts, but they suspect it, they would be even more opposed. The American people do not want more armed shipments do you to think, Ukraine. Do you think your voice would ever be heeded uh, by those in power, by those about 1,000 people as, who are setting the foreign policy, or they just pretend that they don't hear? They understand every word, every sentence, but they're not hearing you. No, they don't want to hear, <laughs> that's for sure. But, uh, you know, still, it is uh, the responsibility of scholars uh, and the responsibility of those who see to try to help clarify, uh, because uh, I think that it can help. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's not easy, because this is not a set of policies put to a public test or where public opinion is the dominant part. A lot of problem in the United States has come that over the last 30 or 40 years, the entire congressional process has become very corrupted. Uh, each election cycle now is well over $10 billion of campaign financing by powerful lobbies. So what I'm saying in the military sphere applies, unfortunately, in other parts of our government, too. The American people know it. They're very unhappy about it. Most Americans think the country is off track, not in a good direction, mm. and that the political system is broken. So this is not uh, uh, a, a view that is uh, uh, unpopular or foreign to the American people, but it's not resolved because when a political system is broken the way it is, it needs reform. There are signs of a stabilized or efforts to stabilize the re this relationship, right? For instance, the military to military video call that was resumed between China and the United States and the summit, of course, last year in San Francisco. It seems that at least the attempts, the intention is there from the United States to stabilize relationship with China. D are you uh, seeing some level, some elements of optimism in that regard? I think the... Uh reason for optimism in 2024 is that in a political campaign, the U.S. will not, I think, engage in uh, some radical military adventure. Uh, that would be devastating politically. Mm. So uh, there will be a lot of uh, heated rhetoric, not very helpful policies, nothing very constructive, no breakthroughs, but perhaps will avoid the worst because of the focus on the political campaign rather than on the global scene. I think the uh, politicians and the White House will not want new global crises this year, but they won't tamp down their rhetoric or they won't aim for solutions very much. Uh, rather, they will focus on their political campaigns. How do you look at the U.S. Um, attempts to surrounding Taiwan in the year 2024? I personally feel that the U.S. attempt to arm Taiwan, whether by giving weapons or selling weapons, is reckless and dangerous, first and foremost, for Taiwan. Uh, the United States did the same in Ukraine. It tried to pump up Ukraine with U.S. weapons after 2014. Look what it got uh, for Ukraine. Uh, it put Ukraine into a devastating war that never would have happened had the United States not tried to arm Ukraine. So I think that the whole U.S. approach 
of saying we're going to pump weapons into Taiwan is reckless, first and foremost, for Taiwan. And I hope that it doesn't encourage uh, some kind of terrible missteps in Taiwan as a result of thinking, well, the U.S. is backing us up with weapons. Everybody should take a deep breath, should calm down, and should not build armaments. We need peace across the straits. And the United States, most of all, should not be shipping arms to Taiwan unilaterally. This is against U.S. interests, U.S. diplomacy, and especially it's against Taiwan's security, in my view. Well, the United States has always talked about defending democracy uh, versus authoritarianism because there are elections in Taiwan where p people vote for the, for, the, for the leaders of the region. So it's a democracy. So the United States need to protect that place from being, you know, unified by the mainland, which is not a democracy. That is all in the U.S.'s uh, definition. Do you buy that kind of narrative? Do you think it is about that? <laughs> not at all. Uh, the U.S. Uh, foreign policy is based on a terrible and illegal idea called regime change. The U.S., uh, since 1947, since the National Security Act and the establishment of the CIA, has seen fit to determine who governs where around the world. Of course, it can't do this, but it tries to do this. There have been more than 80 U.S.-led regime change operations during this period. These are illegal, they are dangerous, and they are destabilizing. Sometimes they throw out democracies and bring in uh, authoritarian governments. Sometimes they throw out authoritarian governments and bring in so-called democracies. But what they almost always do is make a complete mess, lead to war and instability. And the main point that I am emphasizing for U.S. foreign policy above all is the doctrine of non-intervention, which is a global legal doctrine under the U.N. Charter, which is that countries should not in interfere in the internal affairs of other countries, much less try to overthrow their governments. So this is the U.S. terrible habit, and it's completely documented now, dozens and dozens and dozens of cases and it continues, and it's extremely dangerous. It has nothing to do with democracy per se. It has to do with the United States government trying to put in place governments that it thinks will support American interests. Here, the United States, what do you think is the aim of the United States to intervene in the, in the issues of Taiwan? Because Taiwan seems to be particularly interesting for the United States. You know, it doesn't care so much about some other islands that, are, that have historical disputes with, uh, you know, other parts of the country. But in Taiwan, it seems the United States is particularly um, careful not to leave it alone. Because uh, if the United States had not intervened in the, in the, in the situation, um, the two sides probably would have already reunited with each other, and peacefully. Well, there, there was the so-called consensus of 1992, which was a, a consensus to keep things very calm uh, and uh, to keep peace uh, and cooperation across the straits. And the United States, in my view, can't leave good enough alone. Why would a Speaker of the House of Representatives of the United States fly to Taiwan over the strenuous objections uh, of uh, the uh, the government uh, in in Beijing to say don't don't do that don't destabilize uh, please don't interfere the United States likes to interfere it likes to provoke uh, of course there's been a Taiwan lobby uh, going back to 1950 but uh, it's this is aimed also in general at poking uh, at uh, the mainland there's no question about it uh, it's provocative especially because the United States has a one China policy. This is the basis of diplomacy between the PRC and right. the United States of America. And the United States should live up to its diplomacy and not provoke. And what I'm saying in my article is the US is getting no security out of this. We're not safer as a result of this. We're not making the world calmer or more prosperous or more sustainable as a result of all of this. We're not managing our budget out of all of this. We're not gaining economically out of this. This is a business operation it, in the United States, and it's, it is a scam. 
is the United States provoking for the sake of provoking, or what is the strategic or geopolitical interest or economic, I don't know, or the you know um, weapons sales that some people are benefiting? What is the United States getting from provoking China on the issue of Taiwan, from preventing the two sides from getting closer? We don't we don't know when reunification is going to happen, but you know the United States obviously doesn't want to see the two sides get very close. In my opinion, uh, if the United States uh, at a top level uh, and uh, the PRC at a top level sat down and had honest and mutual, respectful uh, diplomacy over this issue, there would be no tensions like this. Uh, this would calm things down. Also, it would calm things down between Taiwan uh, and, and the mainland uh, across the straits, I should say, by pumping in arms, by raising rhetoric, uh, by having uh, U.S. politicians fly over to Taiwan, uh, by having all sorts of uh, outlander statements made by U.S. congressmen and senators who do that for a living, uh, thinking that somehow, I don't know what they're thinking, they're not thinking very much. This has raised the temperature very, very much. And it's extremely dangerous because it just takes a misstep by Taiwanese politicians uh, or by American politicians to set off something that nobody could conceivably want. And unfortunately, this happens. This is what's happened in Ukraine. This is an open war that is ripping to that country to shreds right now mm. that never had to happen at all. Do you think, let me ask you, let me ask the question in this way, do you think the United States has a interest in seeing the two sides separated, seeing the two sides not reunified? Because that will definitely make China a stronger country, a stronger place, a stronger player, if you will. I think in general, the United States is trying to put roadblocks uh, in China's uh, progress uh, economically, technologically, uh, and uh, geopolitically, because uh, China is a big, powerful uh, country. Uh, it is a great civilization. Uh, and the United States has this pretension and presumption of dominance. So if you start out with the idea that you must be number one, not that you must be safe, but that you must be number one, then from the U.S. point of view, China's rise is an affront. It's a threat. Of course, it's no threat at all if seen in a different perspective, if seen in the perspective of cooperation, if seen in the perspective of working together to solve global problems. It's a benefit. It's not a threat. But if your goal is number one, then it is a threat. So at the core of all of this is a big U.S. anxiety. The big U.S. anxiety is the self-perception of the U.S. security state that it must predominate, that it must be number one. Starting from that, everything about China looks like a threat. If we started instead from the U.S. real interest in peace, security, cooperation, facing global challenges like climate change and so forth, we'd have a completely different perception. So it's as we were discussing earlier, when the Secretary of Defense of the United States says we must be the most powerful, it's already a lost cause in a way of security and safety, because if you define foreign policy as being predominant, you can't be safe and secure. If you define foreign policy as peace, cooperation, mutual security, respect for international law, mm. then you can be safe and secure. Yeah. Well, very thought-provoking and very interesting insight. Thank you so much, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, for sharing with us your important insights on these very important issues. Thanks to you. My pleasure.